I made this video to highlight what I appreciate most about Jan Ulrich. I can't remember if it was Manolo Saif in the early 2000s who warned that there were two riders that should be generational idols, men who should go down in the history of cycling as the greatest racers of all time, who were throwing their talent overboard. He was talking about Jan Ulrich and Frank Vandenbroek. In 1997, on the ascent to Arcalis in Andorra, Ulrich experienced his greatest cycling day, leaving the rest of the tour cyclists behind, unable to catch up with his advantage. The moment was supposed to be the announcement of a promising career, a not yet enacted history, the first of many victories in Paris. As Pedro Gonzalez said in 1997, we were in front of a man who could win the next ten Tour de France. And of course, that is the feeling I had at the time. A boy of 22, able to come second as a domestique in the general classification, who wins the last 64k time trial against possibly the best time trial rider in history and his own hero, Miguel Endurian, and takes him by a minute. And at 23, wins the Tour with the greatest demonstration of power seen for many years, something that's outside the cycling logic. Even if Orich had lacked in dedication, he would never have had the same arrogance and perfectionist behaviour as Lance Armstrong. His potential relied so much on the physical aspects of the race that he wouldn't have had to rely on the psychological or tactical aspects of dominating his rivals. At his peak, he represented the perfect marriage of grace and power. Despite the conclusive proof that Orich also doped, condemnation of him has been muted. Many cycling fans are ambivalent, and some appear sympathetic. It's a response that stands in stark contrast to the feelings stirred up by the more divisive Armstrong. On the day before the tour started, Armstrong appeared for his press conference. He arrived like a film star or world leader, in a cocoon of men who might have been bodyguards, and who anxiously scanned the room. It was pure theatre, with a hint of menace, and it all reinforced the Armstrong aura. When Ulrich arrived for his press conference, he shuffled in wearing a tracksuit, looking a little dishevelled, and he was sporting a black eye. Earlier that day, he'd been out training, riding behind one of the T-Mobile team cars, when it suddenly braked, and Ulrich slammed into the rear window. What happened the next day was, in hindsight, inevitable. Armstrong started behind Ulrich in the opening time trial and humiliated him by catching him. The tour was effectively over for Ulrich when it had barely started. After nine years of the same, the German public was finally getting impatient with these sorts of news. The knee injury might have been unfortunate, but then there's always been some misfortune or other in Ulrich's preparation that has prevented him from entering the tour in his best form. When, after an encounter in Tuscany one spring, Bjorn Riesch said that he didn't feel as though Ulrich still wanted to be a professional cyclist, much of the German cycling public silently applauded. Ulrich just doesn't act and live like a professional. He never has. He doesn't want to do what it takes to win. And in the nine years since his tour victory, he's shown himself unwilling and unable to change his ways. I just don't understand him, Lance Armstrong commented on Ulrich. When Ulrich first won the Tour in 1997, experts from Eddie Merckx to the reporters of L'Equipe foresaw a stellar career. The world had not seen a cyclist like him before. But none of the predictions came true. Sure, there was Lance Armstrong, but Ulrich's biggest opponent was always himself. That's why he will never be revered like Roman Polydor. Poupou was the eternal loser, but he was a heroic loser, one who fought to the end never gave up and simply lacked the talent and the luck. Ulrich, however, is just a loser. A loser because he lacked the intelligence, the desire and the discipline to live and train like a champion. Ulrich was the type of person who grew up playing risky games as a way of killing time in his childhood, betting with his friends in competitions involving suffering and endurance. Who would be the last one to hit the brakes before hitting the closed garage door? Who would be able to make the climb without standing up in the saddle? Perhaps, like so many East Germans, he's never fully adapted to the ways of the West. It was one of the markers of East German communist society to discourage self-sufficiency and responsibility. The state planned your life for you, 
The decisions you could make on your own behalf were extremely limited. You didn't choose a career, for instance, but were placed where you were needed. This was true also for young Jan Ulrich. And as it turned out, that was not a good preparation for being a world-class professional athlete and a superstar in the world of commercial sports and mass media. In the GDR, the most talented kids at the local sports clubs were sent to Berlin at the age of 11 to be centrally tested by the nation's best sports scientists. They determined whether the young athlete was suited to win Olympic medals 10 or so years down the road. The ones that passed the test were taken away from home, placed into a sports school in the country's capital, and rigorously prepared for their destiny as sporting heroes of the working class. Of course, Jan Ulrich was one of the chosen. The coaches in Berlin were enthusiastic about this formidable talent from the eastern seaboard city of Rostock. So from the day he was 13 years old, Ulrich was logged into their system. His everyday schedule was preordained. He had to worry about nothing but fulfilling the plans that the wizards of East German sports medicine had concocted for him. Food, lodging, education, his future, everything else was taken out of his hands. After the war came down in 1990, Arwich had the fortune, or misfortune as it sometimes seems now, that things for him largely continued as they were. His coach from the East German National Youth Sporting School, Peter Becker, was not ready to watch his labour of many years go to waste. With resourcefulness, Becker held together his group of young riders and continued his programme with them. After a brief transitional period, Becker found a sponsor. The Hamburg-based car dealer and cycling enthusiast Wolfgang Strohbond was willing to take over the entire squad and fund them. They moved into a house outside the city and recreated a utopia of communist sports education in the midst of capitalist West Germany. Becker, who strongly believes in the ideals of a socialist education to this day, is nostalgic when he remembers those times. It was a perfect collective, he recalls. No one was privileged over anyone else. No one got a better bike than anyone else. Everyone had to take on the same household chores, and a victory of one rider in a race was always perceived as a victory of the entire group. When Jan won a race, he would say, we won, not I won. To internalise the idea of the collective, to become a perfect socialist individual, was the central goal of any education in East Germany. The introduction to a standard textbook on socialist sports education reads, athletic performance is first and foremost the result of a collective endeavour. Only in the collective and through the collective does the personality of the individual unfold. Personal and societal goals are identical. This education for Jan Ulrich was an ideal preparation for his first years as a professional cyclist. He was a devoted and utterly unselfish helper. Not once did he question the team hierarchy in 1996 when he helped Bjorn Ries win the Tour, even though many observers thought even then that Ulrich was clearly the stronger rider. After the 96 season and his second place finish behind Ries, it never occurred to Ulrich to find a new team where he would be the captain, where he would have a team that would support him in trying to win the Tour. Instead, Ulrich repeated over and over that Ries was his captain and that he would be proud to ride for him. Until the now legendary day at Alcalis Andorra. And even then, when at the foot of the decisive climb, Ries conceded that Ulrich was the stronger man, the role of the leader had to be practically forced on Ulrich. Ries ordered Ulrich to win in his stead, and Ulrich took off, leaving everyone behind him with unbelievable ease. Yet in the process, he kept turning round and looking for Ries, as if to make sure that he was actually doing the right thing. His discomfort with the role of the captain is best summed up in the now famous incident between Udo Boltz and Jan Ulrich in the final week of the tour in the Vosges. Ulrich was having a bad day, and Boltz had to remind Ulrich of his responsibility towards the team. When Boltz screamed at his captain to suffer, you pig, the implication was that this was not just about Ulrich. The whole team had sacrificed themselves for 21 tough days to win this tour. And if his individual success was not important enough for Ulrich to push himself to his limit, 
then maybe the success of the team was. Obviously, Boltz knew Ulrich well enough to understand that reminding him of the collective would do the trick. It did. Of course, the tour victory marked only the start of Ulrich's problems. He was never comfortable with the role of celebrity, with the media attention. He was never comfortable with outside expectations. As a result, he stumbled from one crisis into the next, culminating in the drug and alcohol scandals of 2002. And to this day, Ulrich has never really come to terms with what he represents to German fans and to Germany. But Ulrich was not the only East German cyclist who had problems adjusting to the Western system of professional sports. The influx of East German talent and scientific know-how has given German cycling a boost that it would not have otherwise experienced. Some fared better than others. Like Ludwig, Eric Zabel, also a product of the East German system, did exceptionally well for himself. His pro career is truly unparalleled. And unlike Jan Ulrich, he never had a problem with standing up for himself and pursuing his own interest. For his personality type, which is almost completely opposite to Ulrich's, reunification truly was a liberation. When pressure mounts, Jan Ulrich shuts down. The pattern started after his tour of victory in 97, when amidst all the hysteria around him, he fled to a vacation and came home severely out of shape and overweight. It was almost as if to make it visibly impossible for him to fulfil the expectations of the public that he would win the tour over and over again. Ever since, it's been the same story almost every year. The predictable injuries and illnesses and the preparation are uncanny. It seems as though he has somaticized his psychological strategy for dodging expectations. Indeed, there seems to be a subconscious process with Ulrich, one which he is unable to control or to change. He even seems to be suffering from it, as his drug and alcohol escapades and his obvious eating disorders seem to indicate. When the pressure is off, however, Ulrich has always been able to return to his brilliance. Whether it was in the Vuelta in 1999, the 2000 Olympics, or the Tour de France in 2003, when no one expects anything from him, he's at his best. When people, and perhaps when he himself, expects him to deliver, he cracks. By messing up his preparation year after year, it almost seems as though he is creating a situation where it is impossible for him to deliver. When expectations are off, including his own, he's finally free to perform. It's a bizarre drama that Ulrich puts on year after year. In 99, Ulrich already had doubts and declared that he wanted to leave because cycling is a permanent battle against myself. It turns out that Ulrich had also suffered from depression, like Vandenbroek, Jimenez or Kuro Garcia had also done. The fans and the media create a public image of what they expect the star to be. And when he fails to live up to this Im image imposed on him, He's tarred and feathered. Ulrich's story was written the day he first wore the yellow jersey in 97. He was the prodigy, the wunderkind, who would be invincible throughout his lifetime, the new Siegfried. That he turned out instead to be a highly talented but conflicted kid, struggling with his life and his identity and fucking up regularly was never forgiven him. The statistics of his career will remain impressive. Two tour victories five second places, a Vuelta victory, world champion, Olympic champion. Yet he'll be remembered not for what he accomplished, but for what he didn't. After he retired from cycling, he didn't ride a bike for years because he was totally burned out, both physically and psychologically. But in recent years, he's picked up cycling again, competing in veteran races or other types of amateur categories. He often competes under a fake name, taken from a character in The Simpsons, Max Kraft. 